A private prison, or for-profit prison, is a place in which individuals are physically confined or incarcerated by a third party that is contracted by a government agency. Private prison companies typically enter into contractual agreements with governments that commit prisoners and then pay a per diem or monthly rate, either for each prisoner in the facility, or for each place available, whether occupied or not. Such contracts may be for the operation only of a facility, or for design, construction and operation. Private prisons are controversial. The main argument for the contracting of prisons to private operators is that it can save money. The main argument against contracting prisons is concerns that the rights and fair treatment of inmates and citizens will be compromised, due to an array of factors below. Australia. Australia opened its first private prison, Barallan Correctional Centre, in 1990. In 2018, 18.4% of prisoners in Australia were held in private prisons. This was much higher than the rate for the United States, which was 8.4%. Topic: <inaudible> Arguments for and against A 2016 book by Anastasia Glushko a former worker in the private prison sector argues in favour of privately owned prisons in Australia. According to Glushko, private prisons in Australia have decreased the costs of holding prisoners and increased positive relationships between inmates and correctional workers. Outsourcing prison services to private companies has allowed for costs to be cut in half. Compared with $270 a day in a government-run West Australian jail, each prisoner in the privately operated Acacia Prison near Perth costs the taxpayer $182. Glushko also says positive prisoner treatment was observed during privatisation in Australia by including more respectful attitudes to prisoners and mentoring schemes, increased out of cell time, and more purposeful activities. However, a 2016 report from the University of Sydney found that in general, all states of Australia lacked a comprehensive approach to hold private prisons accountable to the government. The authors said that of all the states, Western Australia had the most developed regulatory approach to private prison accountability, as they had learnt from the examples in Queensland and Victoria. Western Australia provided much information about the running of private prisons in the state to the public, making it easier to assess performance. However the authors note that in spite of this, overall it is difficult to compare the performance and costs of private and public prisons as they often house different kinds and amounts of prisoners, in different states with different regulations. They note that Acacia Prison, sometimes held up as an example of how private prisons can be well run, cannot serve as a general example of prison privatization. Topic: Private immigration prisons. Several Australian immigration prisons are privately operated, including the Nauru Regional Processing Centre, which is located on the Pacific Island country of Nauru and operated by Broadspectrum on behalf of the Australian government, with security sub-contracted to Wilson Security. Immigration prisons typically hold people who have overstayed or lack a visa, or otherwise broken the terms of their visas. Some, such as the facility on Nauru, hold asylum seekers, refugees and even young children who can be detained indefinitely. 
In many cases people have been detained for years without charge or trial. This, as well as poor conditions, neglect, harsh treatment and deaths in some of the centres, has been the source of controversy in Australia and internationally. Canada There have only been two private detention facilities in Canada to date, and both reverted to government control. The only private prison in Canada was the Maximum Security Central North Correctional Center, Penetanguishene, Ontario, operated by the U.S. based Management and Training Corporation from its opening in 2001 through the end of its first contract period in 2006. The contract was held by the Ontario Provincial Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services. A government comparison between the Central North Super Jail and a nearly identical facility found that the publicly run prison had measurably better outcomes. Additionally, the GEO Group built the New Brunswick Miramichi Youth Detention Centre under contract with the Provincial Department of Public Safety, then had its contract ended in the 1990s after public protests. As of mid 2012, private prison companies continued to lobby the Correctional Service of Canada for contract contract business. Topic France The process of privatization of prisons in France is present from major events between 1987 to present as reported by a French scholar France has chosen a semi-private system. It consists of delegating the so-called non-sovereign missions kitchen, laundry, maintenance to companies and leaving the guard and security to the state. Organizing inmate work in prison workshops is one of the tasks that has been delegated to the prison management companies. Prison is a space of forced confinement where the overriding concern is security. The fact is that at several levels, and depending on type of prison high security or not, production logic clashes with security logic. Structural limitations of production in a prison can restrict private companies' profit-taking capacities. On the basis of a field study conducted in 2004 and 2005 in five prisons chosen by prison and management type, Gilboard show that the intensity of the tension between production and security, and the various ways this tension arises and is handled, vary by type of prison short stay, for convicts awaiting sentence, or relatively long stay for sentence-serving inmates and type of management. The production, security tension seems better integrated in public sector prisons than in those managed by the private sector in the sense that it produces fewer conflicts in them. This result runs counter to the widespread understanding that shaped the 1987 reform, the idea that introducing private enterprise and the professionalism associated with it into prisons would improve inmate employment and prison operation. Israel Initial attempt In 2004, the Israeli Knesset passed a law permitting the establishment of private prisons in Israel. The Israeli government's motivation was to save money by transferring prisoners to facilities managed by a private firm. The state would pay the franchisee $50 per day for inmate, sparing itself the cost of building new prisons and expanding the staff of the Israel Prison Service. 
In 2005, the Human Rights Department of the Academic College of Law in Ramat Gan filed a petition with the Israeli Supreme Court challenging the law. The petition relied on two arguments, first, it said transferring prison powers to private hands would violate the prisoner's fundamental human rights to liberty and dignity. Secondly, a private organization always aims to maximize profit, and would therefore seek to cut costs by, such means as skimping on prison facilities and paying its guards poorly, thus further undermining the prisoner's rights. As the case awaited decision, the first prison was built by the concessionaire, Lev Lviv's Africa Israel Investments, a facility near Beersheba designed to accommodate 2,000 inmates. <laughs> Israeli Supreme Court rejection In November 2009, an expanded panel of nine judges of the Israeli Supreme Court ruled privately run prisons are unconstitutional, finding for the state to transfer authority for managing the prison to a private contractor whose aim is monetary profit would severely violate the prisoner's basic human rights to dignity and freedom. Supreme Court President Dorit Benish, wrote, Israel's basic legal principles hold that the right to use force in general, and the right to enforce criminal law by putting people behind bars in particular, is one of the most fundamental and one of the most invasive powers in the state's jurisdiction. Thus when the power to incarcerate is transferred to a private corporation whose purpose is making money, the act of depriving a person of their liberty loses much of its legitimacy. Because of this loss of legitimacy, the violation of the prisoner's right to liberty goes beyond the violation entailed in the incarceration itself. New Zealand In 2018, 10% of prisoners in New Zealand were housed in private prisons. Prison privatisation The use of private prisons has also been tried, stopped and reintroduced. New Zealand's first privately run prison, the Auckland Central Remand Prison, also known as Mount Eden Prison, opened under contract to Australasian Correctional Management in 2000. In 2004, the Labour government, opposed to privatisation, amended the law to prohibit the extension of private prison contracts. A year later, the five-year contract with ACM was not renewed. In 2010, the national government again introduced private prisons and international conglomerate Serco was awarded the contract to run the Mount Eden Prison. Numerous scandals surrounding the Mount Eden Prison lead to Serco's contract not being renewed there. On 16 July 2015, footage of ''fight clubs'' within the prison emerged online and was reported by TVNZ. Serco was heavily criticized for not investigating until after the footage was screened. On 24 July 2015, Serco's contract to run the Mount Eden prison was revoked and operation was given back to the New Zealand Department of Corrections. Serco was ordered to pay $8 million to the New Zealand government as a result of problems at Mount Eden prison while it was under Serco's management. Serco has also been given the contract to build and manage a 960-bed prison at Wirri. The contract with Serco provides for stiff financial penalties if its rehabilitation programs fail to reduce reoffending by 10% more than the corrections department programs. 
The Auckland South Corrections facility was opened on 8 May 2015. The contract to operate the prison ends in 2040. Topic: Growth in prison population. Since it was established, the department has had to cope with a dramatic growth in the prison population. Between 1997 and 2011 the number of inmates increased by 70% and, at 190 prisoners per 100,000 of population in 2011, New Zealand has one of the higher rates of imprisonment in the Western world. Five new prisons have been built in the last ten years when, to accommodate the increase. The fifth Labour government built four prisons, at Narfa Northern Region housing 420 prisoners, Spring Hill north of Huntley housing 840, Auckland Women's holding 330 and Milton Otago holding 425 at a cost of $890 million. When National came to power in 2008, the department built a new 1,000-bed prison at Mount Eden for $218 million in a public-private partnership and gave the contract to Serco. The department's growth has been such that in July 2010, Finance Minister Bill English expressed concerns that government spending was led by a rapidly expanding prison system which would soon make corrections the government's biggest department." As at December 2011, New Zealand had 20 prisons and the department employed over 8,000 staff. The department's operating budget is over $1 billion a year. As at 31 March 2011, there were 8,755 people in prison in New Zealand. However, the prison population is very fluid and altogether about 20,000 people spend time in prison each year, the vast majority on remand. Nearly 75% of those given a prison sentence are sentenced to two years or less, and all these are automatically released halfway through their sentence. As of 2001, 96% of inmates were men and 51% of male inmates were Maori, so Maori were over-represented on a population basis by 3.5 times. The cost of keeping a person in prison for 12 months is $91,000. In 2001 the department estimated that a lifetime of offending by one person costs victims and taxpayers $3 million. Despite English's concerns about the growing cost, in 2011 the government approved the building of a 960-bed prison at Wirri estimated to cost nearly $400 million. Later that year, justice sector forecasts showed a drop in the projected prison forecast for the first time. Charles Chauvel, Labour Party spokesperson for justice, and the Public Service Association both questioned the need for a new facility when there were 1,200 empty beds in the prison system. In March 2012, Corrections Minister Anne Tolley announced the new prison would enable older prisons such as Mount Crawford in Wellington and the new Plymouth Prison to be closed. Older units at Uruhata, Rolston, Tongariro, Rangapo and Waikaria prisons will also be shut down. <laughs> <laughs> United Kingdom <laughs> Number of prisoners In 2018, 18.46% of prisoners in England and Wales were housed in private prisons, 15.3% of prisoners in Scotland were housed in private prisons. Topic: 
Topic: Development. In the modern era, the United Kingdom was the first European country to use for-profit prisons. Wold's Prison opened as the first privately managed prison in the UK in 1992. This was enabled by the passage of the Criminal Justice Act 1991 which empowered the Home Secretary to contract out prison services to the private sector. In addition, a number of the UK's immigration removal centres are privately operated, including the Harmonsworth Immigration Removal Centre, Yarl's Wood Immigration Removal Centre, and Colnbrick Immigration Removal Centre. In 2007 the new Scottish National Party government in Scotland announced that it was opposed to privately run prisons and would not let any more contracts. Since then, new prisons in Scotland have been built and run by the public sector. The last contract let in England and Wales was for Ham Prison Northumberland, which transferred from the public sector to Sodexo in 2013. The most recent new prison to be built in England and Wales, Ham Prison Berwyn near Wrexham, was given to the public sector to operate without any competition when it opened in 2017. In the 2017 general election, the Labour Party said that there would not be any new private prisons under a Labour government, but did not commit to ending prematurely existing contracts. On 5 November 2018, the prison's minister, Rory Stewart, told the House of Commons that two new prisons at Wellingborough, Northants, and Glen Parva, Leicestershire, would be built using conventional public finance, but their operation would be contracted out. On 29 November, he announced a framework competition, under which private operators would seek to be placed on a list of companies which would be eligible to bid in future competitions, including the planned programme for 10,000 new places to replace old prisons, and also for prisons currently operated privately, when those contracts end. It was implied that the public sector would be excluded from all such competitions. He said, this government remains committed to a role for the private sector in operating custodial services. The competition launched today will seek to build on the innovation and different ways of working that the private sector has previously introduced to the system. The sector has an important role to play, and currently runs some high performing prisons, as part of a decent and secure prison estate. A balanced approach to custodial services provision, which includes a mix of public, voluntary, and private sector involvement, has been shown to introduce improvements and deliver value for money for taxpayers. Announcement on the 29th of November. Topic: Contractual arrangements. In the UK, there are three ways in which a private company may take on management of a prison. Companies compete to finance, design, build, and run a new prison under the private finance initiative. Most prisons in the UK are of this kind, although the use of PFI has now been abandoned. The government builds a prison and then contracts out its operation. A prison formerly operated by the public sector prison service may be contracted out after competition. Market testing. Prisons may be re-competed at the end of the contract. Increasingly, a range of services within all prisons, whether public or privately run, are contracted out on a regional basis, this includes works and FM services, and rehabilitation programs. Governance and accountability 
privately run prisons are run under contracts which set out the standards that must be met, which in many respects mirror the service level agreements which apply to publicly run prisons. Payments may be deducted for poor performance against the contract. Government monitors, controllers, work permanently within each privately managed prison to check on conditions and treatment of prisoners. The framework for regulation and accountability is much the same for privately run prisons as for publicly run ones. In England and Wales they are subject to unannounced inspection by HM Chief Inspector of Prisons, to monitoring by local independent monitoring boards and prisoner complaints are dealt with by the Prison and Probation Ombudsman. Similar arrangements exist in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Evaluation <inaudible> 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 There has been little systematic, objective evaluation of private prisons in the UK. The best study, by the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge University, using direct observation of staff and prisoner behaviour, found that public sector staff tended to be more knowledgeable and confident, while the private sector treated prisoners more respectfully, though one private prison scored well on both. Earlier, cruder, studies came to broadly the same conclusion. Another study found marked improvements in prisoner quality of life at Birmingham Prison after transfer from public to private sector. An analysis of performance assessments of individual prisons by the Chief Inspector of Prisons and by the Prison Service suggested no consistent difference in service quality between sectors. The same study showed that construction and operating costs were for many years much lower in the private sector sector, but that the gap has narrowed. Controversies In early 2012, Francis Crook, chief executive of the Howard League for Penal Reform said Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons encountered an almost nine-fold rise in restraint used in the previous year at Ashfield Young Offenders Institution, which holds 15 to 18-year-olds. She cited, "...many incidents of strip-searching children unnecessarily." Force had been used almost 150 times a month compared to 17 times monthly the prior year, recalling it had chilling echoes of circumstances in the choking death of a 15 year old at Rainsbrick Secure Training Center after restraints had been applied. Frequent use of force followed failure of wards to obey staff instructions. Three years earlier the institution recorded more than 600 attacks on inmates in one year, the highest number of every jail, including adults, in the country. Crook claimed, "...this jail has a history of failing children and the public." Managers claimed the increase was due to better reporting of the use of restraints. The institution had been half full during the previous unannounced inspection in 2010. The chief inspector of prisons noted, "...some staff lacked confidence in challenging poor behavior." The director of the prison and the YOI admitted there is, "...room for improvement." Six members of staff were dismissed from G4S operated Rainsbrick Secure Training Center for Children in Rugby in May 2015 following a series of incidents of gross misconduct. G4S took the action in response to an Ofsted inspection that reported some staff being on drugs while on duty, colluding with detainees and behaving extremely inappropriately. 
The behavior allegedly included causing distress and humiliation to children by subjecting them to degrading treatment and racist comments. Four G4S team leaders of Medway Secure Training Center in Rochester were arrested in January 2016, and four other staff members were placed on restricted duties following an investigation by the BBC's Panorama TV program into the center. Allegations in the television program included foul language and use of unnecessary force, such physical violence, overuse of restraint techniques causing one teenager to have difficulties breathing on ten boys aged 14 to 17, as well as a cover-up involving members of staff by avoiding surveillance cameras in order not to be recorded, and purposefully misreporting incidents in order to avoid potential fines and punishment, for example, in one exchange, it was claimed some staff don't report, two or more trainees fighting, because it indicates they've lost control of the center. Resulting in a potential fine, G4S run Medway managers received performance related pay awards in April 2016, despite the Chief Inspector of Prisons Weeks saying weeks earlier that, managerial oversight failed to protect young people from harm at the jail. In January, Panorama showed an undercover reporter working as a guard at the Medway Secure Training Center in Kent. The film showed children allegedly being mistreated and claimed that staff falsified records of violent incidents. No senior managers were disciplined or dismissed. Prior to the Panorama program's broadcast, the Youth Justice Board YJB, which oversees youth custody in England, stopped placing children in Medway. In February, a Guardian investigation revealed that, in 2003, whistleblowers had warned G4S, the Ministry of Justice and the YJB that staff were mistreating detained children. Their letter, forwarded by Professor John Pitts, a youth justice expert, was ignored. When the prison's inspectorate carried out a SNAP inspection at Medway it found detainees reported staff had used insulting, aggressive or racist language toward them and felt unsafe in facility portions not covered by closed-circuit TV. Reviewers agreed to the legitimacy of evidence presented by Panorama showing targeted bullying of vulnerable boys by employees, and that a larger group of staff must have been aware of unacceptable practice but did not challenge or report this behavior. In an earlier Ofsted report on Medway, inspectors said staff and middle managers reported feeling a lack of leadership and having low, or no confidence in senior managers. Nick Hardwick, at the time the chief inspector of prisons said, "...managerial oversight failed to protect young people from harm." Effective oversight is key to creating a positive culture that prevents poor practice happening and ensuring it is reported when it does. The Guardian newspaper learned that senior managers at Medway received performance related pay awards in April amounting to between 10 to 25% of their annual salaries, according to seniority. One 15-year-old girl placed at Medway in 2009 said she was frequently unlawfully restrained over 18 months, citing an occasion in which her face was repeatedly slammed into icy ground. I assumed the senior management team would be sacked. But now it looks like they have been rewarded for allowing children to be abused in prison. She said. Former Labour MP Sally Keeble has complained about G4S maltreatment in STCs for over 10 years, stating, "...this is people making personal profit out of tragedy." 
I hope that Justice Minister Liz Truss would intervene and make sure these bonuses are not being paid by a Ministry of Justice contractor." Notwithstanding the results of the investigations no senior managers at Medway were disciplined or dismissed. In May, the MOJ said the National Offender Management Service would take over the running of Medway. In July, it formally assumed control of the STC. In February 2016, G4S had announced that it was to sell its children's services business, including the contract to manage two secure training centers. The company hoped to complete the process by the end of 2016, following release of an extremely critical report regarding a G4S operated jail. The Labour Party's Shadow Justice Secretary said they would be inclined to take control of for profit prisons if the industry competitors had not met deadlines imposed upon them. Sadiq Khan's response stressed the need for better contracting, to include liquidated damages provisions. The Chief Inspector of Prisons Nick Hardwick, recommended the crafting of a takeover contingency plan. It's not delivering what the public should expect of the millions being paid to G4S to run it. Khan said. I see no difference whether the underperformance is in the public, private or voluntary sector. We shouldn't tolerate mediocrity in the running of our prisons." Khan continued, we can't go on with scandal after scandal, where the public's money is being squandered and the quality of what's delivered isn't up to scratch. The government is too reliant on a cozy group of big companies. The public are rightly getting fed up to the back teeth of big companies making huge profits out of the taxpayer, which smacks to them of rewards for failure. <laughs> United States Private prisons are operated in the United States of America. In 2018, 8.41% of prisoners in the United States were housed in private prisons. <laughs> Early history The privatization of prisons can be traced to the contracting out of confinement and care of prisoners after the American Revolution. Deprived of the ability to ship criminals and undesirables to the colonies, Great Britain began placing them on hulks used as prison ships moored in English ports, in 1852, on the northwest San Francisco Bay in California, inmates of the prison ship Waban began building a contract facility to house themselves at Point Quentin. The prison became known as San Quentin, which is still in operation today. Its partial transfer of prison administration from private to public did not mark the end of privatization. The next phase began with the Reconstruction Period 1865 to 1876 in the South after the end of the Civil War. Plantations and businessmen needed to find replacements for the labor force once their slaves had been freed. Beginning in 1868, convict leases were issued to private parties to supplement their workforce. This system remained in place until the early 20th century. Development. Federal and state governments have a long history of contracting out specific services to private firms, including medical services, food preparation, vocational training, and inmate transportation. However, the 1980s ushered in a new era of prison privatization. 
with a burgeoning prison population resulting from the war on drugs and increased use of incarceration, prison overcrowding and rising costs became increasingly problematic for local, state, and federal governments. In response to this expanding criminal justice system, private business interests saw an opportunity for expansion, and consequently, private sector involvement in prisons moved from the simple contracting of services to contracting for the complete management and operation of entire prisons. The modern private prison business first emerged and established itself publicly in 1984 when the Corrections Corporation of America CCA, now known as CareCivic, was awarded a contract to take over a facility in Shelby County, Tennessee. This marked the first time that any government in the country had contracted out the complete operation of a jail to a private operator. The following year, CCA gained further public attention when it offered to take over the entire state prison system of Tennessee for $200 million. The bid was ultimately defeated due to strong opposition from public employees and the skepticism of the state legislature. Despite that initial defeat, CCA since then has successfully expanded, as have other for-profit prison companies. Statistics from the U.S. Department of Justice show that, as of 2013, there were 133,000 state and federal prisoners housed in privately owned prisons in the U.S., constituting 8.4% of the overall U.S. prison population. Broken down to prison type, 19.1% of the federal prison population in the United States is housed in private prisons and 6.8% of the U.S. state prison population is housed in private prisons. While 2013 represented a slight decline in private prison population over 2012, the overall trend over the preceding decade had been a slow increase. However, as of 2017, after a period of steady growth, the number of inmates held in private prisons in the United States has declined modestly and continues to represent a small share of the nation's total prison population. Companies operating such facilities include the Corrections Corporation of America (CCA), the Geo Group Inc., formerly known as Wackenhut Securities, Management and Training Corporation (MTC), and Community Education Centers. In the past two decades, CCA has seen its profits increase by more than 500%. The prison industry as a whole took in over $5 billion in revenue in 2011. According to journalist Matt Tybee, Wall Street banks took notice of this influx of cash, and are now some of the prison industry's biggest investors. Wells Fargo has around $100 million invested in Geo Group and $6 million in CCA. Other major investors include Bank of America, Fidelity Investments, General Electric and the Vanguard Group. CCA's share price went from a dollar in 2000 to $34.34 .34 in 2013. Sociologist John L. Campbell and activist and journalist Chris Hedges respectively assert that prisons in the United States have become a lucrative and hugely profitable business in June 2013 students at Columbia University discovered that the institution owned 8 million dollars worth of CCA stock less than a year later students formed a group called Columbia Prison Divest and delivered a letter to the president of the university demanding total divestment from CCA and full disclosure of future investments. By June 2015, the Board of Trustees at Columbia University voted to divest from the private prison industry. Curry Civic previously CCA has a capacity of more than 80,000 beds in 65 correctional facilities. 
The GEO Group operates 57 facilities with a capacity of 49,000 offender beds. The company owns or runs more than 100 properties that operate more than 73,000 beds in sites across the world. Most privately run facilities are located in the southern and western portions of the United States and include both state and federal offenders. For example, Pecos, Texas is the site of the largest private prison in the world, the Reeves County Detention Complex, operated by the GEO Group. It has a capacity of 3,763 prisoners in its three sub complexes. Private prison firms, reacting to reductions in prison populations, are increasingly looking away from mere incarceration and are seeking to maintain profitability by expanding into new markets previously served by non profit behavioral health and treatment oriented agencies, including prison medical care forensic mental hospitals, civil commitment centers, halfway houses and home arrest. A 2016 report by the US Department of Justice asserts that privately operated federal facilities are less safe, less secure and more punitive than other federal prisons. Shortly thereafter, the DOJ announced it will stop using private prisons. Nevertheless, a month later the Department of Homeland Security renewed a controversial contract with the CCA to continue operating the South Texas Family Residential Center, an immigrant detention facility in Dilly, Texas. Stock prices for CCA and GEO Group surged following Donald Trump's victory in the 2016 elections. On February 23, the DOJ under Attorney General Jeff Sessions overturned the ban on using private prisons. According to Sessions, the Obama administration memorandum changed longstanding policy and practice, and impaired the Bureau's ability to meet the future needs of the federal correctional system. Therefore, I direct the Bureau to return to its previous approach. Topic: Escape of Arizona Murderers. In the wake of the escape of three murderers from the minimum, medium security Kingman Prison, Arizona, operated by Management and Training Corporation (MTC) and its gruesome aftermath, Arizona Attorney General and gubernatorial candidate Terry Goddard said. I believe a big part of our problem is that the very violent inmates, like the three that escaped, ended up getting reclassified as a lower risk quickly and sent to private prisons that were just not up to the job. The private prison had inadequate patrols and prisoner movement, excessive false alarms, a lax culture, and inconsistencies in visitor screening procedures. One escaping murderer, Daniel Rennick, immediately absconded with the intended getaway vehicle, abandoning his companions outside the prison. He was involved in a shootout in Rifle, Colorado, about 30 hours after the prison break, and was captured by a Garfield County deputy and rifle police. Though he still owed Arizona 32 years on his sentence, he was sentenced to 60 years to be served first in Colorado. In the course of evading pursuers, the remaining two escapees and their accomplice, Caslin Welch, kidnapped and hijacked vacationing Oklahomans Gary and Linda Haas in New Mexico. The couple was soon murdered by the ringleader, John McCluskey. The extended family of the murdered couple sued the state of Arizona, as well as Dominion, a corporation based in Edmond, Oklahoma, that spec built the prison, and MTC, the corporation that managed it, for $40 million. The last escapees and their accomplice were soon captured. Tracy Province, a lifer, was apprehended in Wyoming on August 9. 
The final pair were arrested on August 19, 20 days after the jailbreak, upon their return to Arizona. All three were first convicted of the escapes, initial hijacking, kidnappings and robberies in Kingman, Arizona. Then they were charged with the same crimes plus murder in New Mexico. John McCluskey, the ringleader, and his accomplice, Caslin Welch, were also alleged to have committed an armed robbery in Arkansas. The three were eventually held on federal murder charges in New Mexico. McCluskey was tried on death penalty charges but after five months of court proceedings, his jury gave him life imprisonment on December 11, 2013. Estimates of the costs of the nationwide searches as well as the apprehensions, prosecutions and subsequent imprisonment in the three states greatly exceed a million dollars. Torrance County Detention Center Torrance County Detention Center is in Estancia, New Mexico. Estancia has a population of about 1,500 residents, while Torrance County has a population of more than 15,000. The Torrance County Detention Facility houses about 580 prisoners, most of them federal inmates. The head of the Torrance County Detention Center, Garland was told the prison needs closer 700 beds filled to stay open. For several years they have not been able to maintain this quota and are being forced to shut down. The closure will cost the town of Estancia about $700,000 annually, according to the county's news release, and will result in about $300,000 worth of lost tax income for the county. I'm concerned about the jobs. Garland said. We are losing a large part of our workforce. Garland said the prison's imminent closure will affect the county in a number of ways, not the least of which is that the county, which does not have its own jail, will have to find another place to house the 40 to 75 inmates it sends there each month. The company told the county it has been holding fewer federal detainees for immigration and customs enforcement, Garland said. This example in the private prison system shows how locking people up in private prisons in order to maintain a quota can lead to a conflict of interest between the justice system. While also being a detriment to local economies if they are unable to perform their services. <laughs> Increase in the prison population From 1925 to 1980 the prison population stayed consistent with the general population. The private prison population began to increase at an disproportional rate in 1983 the year that private prisons began operation in the United States. From 1925 to 1980 the prison population had a gradual increase from 150,000 to 250,000. However, from 1983 to 2016 the prison population has increased from 250,000 to 1,500,000. There is a direct correlation in the increase of private prisons and citizens incarcerated. The statistics from the Problem with Private Prisons, Justice Policy Institute say that from 1990 to 2005 there was a 1,600% increase in the American private prison population, most are federal prisoners from government prisons, which are cheaper which ties into the topic below. <laughs> <laughs> Cost-benefit analysis 
Studies, some partially industry funded, often conclude that states can save money by using for profit prisons. However, academic or state funded studies have found that private prisons tend to keep more low cost inmates and send high cost back to state run prisons. This is counterproductive to the cost benefit analysis of the private prisons and contradicts the original selling point of the CCA and other private prisons to mitigate the cost of running prisons. Topic: <laughs> Costs. Proponents of privately run prisons contend that cost savings and efficiency of operation place private prisons at an advantage over public prisons and support the argument for privatization, but some research casts doubt on the validity of these arguments, as evidence has shown that private prisons are neither demonstrably more cost effective, nor more efficient than public prisons. An evaluation of 24 different studies on cost effectiveness revealed that, at best, results of the question are inconclusive and, at worst, there is no difference in cost effectiveness. A study by the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics found that the cost savings promised by private prisons have simply not materialized. Some research has concluded that for-profit prisons cost more than public prisons. Furthermore, cost estimates from privatization advocates may be misleading, because private facilities often refuse to accept inmates that cost the most to house. A 2001 study concluded that a pattern of sending less expensive inmates to privately run facilities artificially inflated cost savings. A 2005 study found that Arizona's public facilities were seven times more likely to house violent offenders and three times more likely to house those convicted of more serious offenses. A 2011 report by the American Civil Liberties Union point out that private prisons are more costly, more violent and less accountable than public prisons, and are actually a major contributor to increased mass incarceration. This is most apparent in Louisiana, which has the highest incarceration rate in the world and houses the majority of its inmates in for-profit facilities. Marie Gottschalk, professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania, argues that the prison industry "...engages in a lot of cherry-picking and cost-shifting to maintain the illusion that the private sector does it better for less." In fact, she notes that studies generally show that private facilities are more dangerous for both correctional officers and inmates than their public counterparts as a result of cost-cutting measures, such as spending less on training for correctional officers and paying them lower wages and providing only the most basic medical care for inmates. A 2014 study by a doctoral candidate at UC Berkeley shows that minorities make up a greater percentage of inmates at private prisons than in their public counterparts, largely because minorities are cheaper to incarcerate. According to the study, for-profit prison operators, in particular CCA and GEO Group, accumulate these low-cost inmates, "...through explicit and implicit exemptions written into contracts between these private prison management companies and state departments of correction. Inadequacies including staff training Evidence suggests that lower staffing levels and training at private facilities may lead to increases in the incidence of violence and escapes. A nationwide study found that assaults on guards by inmates were 49% more frequent in private prisons than in government-run prisons. 
The same study revealed that assaults on fellow inmates were 65% more frequent in private prisons, an example of private prisons' inadequate staff training leading to jail violence was reported by two Bloomberg News journalists, Margaret Newkirk and William Selway in Mississippi regarding the now-closed Walnut Grove Correctional Facility WGCF. According to the journalists, the ratio of staff to prisoners in this prison was only 1 to 120. In a bloody riot in this prison, six inmates were rushed to the hospital, including one with permanent brain damage. During the riot, the staff of the prison did not respond but waited until the melee ended, because prisoners outnumbered staff by a ratio of 60 to 1. The lack of well-trained staff does not only lead to violence but also corruption. According to a former WGCF prisoner, the corrections officers were also responsible for smuggling operations within the prison. To make more money, some provided prisoners with contraband, including drugs, cell phones and weapons. Law enforcement investigations led to the exposure of a far wider web of corruption. Topic: Bureaucratic corruption scandals. At the Walnut Grove CF, intense corruption was involved in the construction and operation of, and subcontracting for medical, commissary and other services. After exposure of the rape of a female transitional center prisoner by the mayor, who also served as a warden, a bribery scheme was uncovered. It had paid millions to the corrupt Mississippi Department of Corrections Commissioner Chris Epps and his condits. Ten additional officials and consultants, including three former state legislators two Republicans and one Democrat, were indicted in the Department of Justice's Operation Mississippi Hustle Prosecution. Prior to the Mississippi investigations and prosecutions, a similar investigation began in 2003, dubbed Operation Polar Pen, exposed a wide-ranging bribery scheme of what legislative members themselves called the "'Corrupt Bastards Club' CBC. It initially involved for-profit corrections, then extended to include fisheries management and oil industry taxation. At least 15 targets of the investigation, including 10 sitting or former elected officials, the governor's chief of staff, and four lobbyists were considered for possible prosecution, and a dozen were indicted. Investigation of a Democratic state senator found nothing amiss, but ten indictments were issued that included six Republican state legislators, two halfway House lobbyists, two very wealthy contractors and the U.S. Senator, Ted Stevens. The seven felony convictions against Stevens were overturned, as were verdicts involving three other legislators and the governor's chief of staff, one directly due to the Supreme Court's overturning part of the existing, "...honest services fraud," in the case of Representative Bruce Weyrach. Weyrach pleaded guilty to a state misdemeanor. Others also had their verdicts overturned, in part because the prosecution failed to completely disclose exculpatory evidence to their defense, but three of those also pleaded guilty to lesser charges. Though they were implicated, the Department of Justice also declined to prosecute a former state senator and the U.S. congressman, Don Young, who spent over a million dollars on his defense, though he was never indicted. <laughs> <laughs> Judicial corruption scandal 
In the Kids for Cash scandal, Mid-Atlantic Youth Services Corp., a private prison company which runs juvenile facilities, was found guilty of paying two judges, Mark C. Avarella and Michael Conahan, $2.8 million to send 2,000 children to their prisons for such crimes as trespassing in vacant buildings and stealing DVDs from Walmart. Topic lobbying From 1999 to 2010, the Sentencing Project found that Corrections Corporation of America CCA spent on average, $1.4 million per year on lobbying at the federal level and employed a yearly average of 70 lobbyists at the state level. The influence of the for profit prison industry on the government has been described as the prison industrial complex, Curry Civic, previously. CCA, MTC and the GEO Group have been members of the American Legislative Exchange Council a Washington, D.C.-based public policy organization that develops model legislation that advances free market principles such as privatization. Under their Criminal Justice Task Force, ALEC has developed model bills which state legislators can then consult when proposing tough on crime initiatives including truth in sentencing and three strikes laws. By funding and participating in ALEC's criminal justice task forces, critics argue, private prison companies influence legislation for tougher, longer sentences. Writing in Governing Magazine in 2003, Alan Greenblatt states, ALEC has been a major force behind both privatizing state prison space and keeping prisons filled. It puts forward bills providing for mandatory minimum sentences and three strikes sentencing requirements. About 40 states passed versions of Alex Truth in Sentencing Model Bill, which requires prisoners convicted of violent crimes to serve most of their sentences without chance of parole. According to Cooper, Heldman, Ackerman, and Farrar Myers 2016, ALEC has been known to push for the expansion of the private prison industry by promoting greater use of private prisons, goods, and services, promoting greater use of prison labor, and increasing the size of prison populations. ALEC has had a hand in not only broadening the definition of existing crimes, but also in the creation of new crimes. ALEC is known for developing policies that may threaten civil liberties by increasing the probabilities of incarceration and lengthy sentences Cooper A. Al, 2016. According to a 2010 report by NPR, ALEC arranged meetings between the Corrections Corporation of America and Arizona's state legislators such as Russell Pierce at the Grand Hyatt in Washington, D.C. to write Arizona SB 1070, which would keep CCA's immigrant detention centers stuffed with detainees. CCA and GEO have both engaged in state initiatives to increase sentences for a offenders and to create new crimes, including, CCA helping to finance Proposition 6 in California in 2008 and geo-lobbying for Jessica's Law in Kansas in 2006. In 2012, the CCA sent a letter to 48 states offering to buy public prisons in exchange for a promise to keep the prisons at 90% occupancy for 20 years. States that sign such contracts with prison companies must reimburse them for beds that go unused. In 2011, Arizona agreed to pay Management and Training Corporation $3 million for empty beds when a 97% quota wasn't met. In 2012, it was reported that the D had met up with the CCA to incorporate laws that would increase the CCA's prison population and in turn increase the CCA's prison population. 
CCA, now Curry Civic, closed their facility in Estancia, New Mexico as the lack of prisoners made them unable to turn a profit, which left 200 employees without jobs. The Center for Responsive Politics reported that private prison corporations donated a record breaking 1.6 million in federally disclosed contributions in the 2018 midterm elections. Topic: Opposition. Many organizations have called for a moratorium on construction of private prisons or for their outright abolition. The Presbyterian Church (USA) and United Methodist Church have also joined the call, as well as the Catholic bishops of the South organization. As of 2013, there has been a modest pushback against the private prison industry, with protests forcing Geo Group to withdraw its $6 million offer for naming rights of FAU Stadium, and Kentucky allowing its contract with the CCA to expire, ending three three decades of allowing for-profit companies to operate prisons in that state. In 2014, Idaho will be taking over the operation of the Idaho Correctional Center from the CCA, which has been the subject of a plethora of lawsuits alleging rampant violence, understaffing, gang activity and contract fraud. Idaho Governor Butch Otter said, in recognition of what's happened, what's happening, it's necessary. It's the right thing to do. It's disappointing because I am a champion of privatization." In the final quarter of 2013, Scopia Capital Management, DSM North America, and Amica Mutual Insurance divested around $60 million from CCA and GEO Group. In a Color of Change press release, DSM North America President Hugh Welsh said, In accordance with the principles of the UN Global Compact, with respect to the protection of internationally proclaimed human rights, the pension fund has divested from the for-profit prison industry. Investment in private prisons and support for the industry is financially unsound, and divestment was the right thing to do for our clients, shareholders, and the country as a whole. <laughs> Attempts to limit privatization and increase oversight Some U.S. states have imposed bans, population limits, and strict operational guidelines on private prisons Banning privatization of state and local facilities — Illinois in 1990 Private Correctional Facility Moratorium Act, and New York in 2000, enacted laws that ban the privatization of prisons, correctional facilities and any services related to their operation. Louisiana enacted a moratorium on private prisons in 2001. Banning speculative private prison construction for profit prison companies have built new prisons before they were awarded privatization contracts in order to lure state contract approval. In 2001, Wisconsin's Joint Budget Committee recommended language to ban all future speculative prison construction in the state. Such anticipatory building dates back to at least 1997, when Corrections Corporation of America built a 2,000-bed facility in California at a cost of $80–100 million with no contract from the California Department of Corrections, a CCA official was quoted as saying, "...if we build it, they will come." Banning exportation and importation of prisoners to ensure that the state retains control over the quality and security of correctional facilities. North Dakota passed a bill in 2001 that banned the export of Class A and AA felons outside the state. 
Similarly, Oregon allowed an existing exportation law to sunset in 2001, effectively banning the export of prisoners. Several states have considered banning the importation of prisoners to private facilities. Requiring standards comparable to state prisons, New Mexico enacted legislation that transfers supervision of private prisons to the State Secretary of Corrections, ensuring that private prisons meet the same standards as public facilities. In 2001, Nebraska legislation that requires private prisons to meet public prison standards was overwhelmingly approved by the legislature, but pocket vetoed by the governor. Oklahoma passed a law in 2005 that requires private prisons to have emergency plans in place and mandates state notification of any safety incidents. The Federal Bureau of Prisons announced its intent to end for profit prison contracts. Terminating federal contracts. On August 18, 2016, Deputy U.S. Attorney General Sally Yates announced that the Justice Department intended to end its Bureau of Prisons contracts with for-profit prison operators, because it concluded, "...the facilities are both less safe and less effective at providing correctional services..." than the Federal Bureau of Prisons. In response, Issa Arnita, the spokesperson for the third largest U.S. for profit prison operator management and training corporation, said it was disappointed to learn about the DOJ's decision. If the DOJ's decision to end the use of contract prisons were based solely on declining inmate populations, there may be some justification, but to base this decision on cost, safety and security, and programming is wrong." In a memorandum, Yates continued, for profit, Prisons served an important role during a difficult period, but time has shown that they compare poorly to our own bureau facilities. They simply do not provide the same level of correctional services, programs, and resources, they do not save substantially on costs, and as noted in a recent report by the Department's Office of Inspector General, they do not maintain the same level of safety and security. The rehabilitative services that the Bureau provides, such as educational programs and job training, have proved difficult to replicate and outsource and these services are essential to reducing recidivism and improving public safety. Also, the recidivism rates of the private prisons, within three years of release, about two-thirds of released prisoners were rearrested. Within five years of release, about three-quarters of released prisoners were rearrested. Of those prisoners who were rearrested, more than half .7 were arrested by the end of the first year. These private prison recidivism rates, compared to the public prison's recidivism rates, are virtually identical and in return have minuscule benefits. At the time, the Justice Department held 193,000 inmates, about 22,000 of whom were in 14 private prisons. Criminal justice reform had caused the prison population to drop by about 25,000 inmates over the previous few years. Separately the Department of Homeland Security intends to continue to hold some suspected illegal aliens in private prisons. <laughs> Media coverage in the United States Topic: Documentary. Kids for Cash Scandal was featured in Capitalism: A Love Story, the 2009 documentary by Michael Moore. 
a full-length documentary covering the Kids for Cash scandal entitled Kids for Cash was released in February 2014. Thirteenth is an Oscar-nominated 2016 documentary that examines the role of private prison contracts in the mass incarceration of blacks and Latinos, primarily, in the United States. The name refers to the Thirteenth Amendment which abolished slavery, yet allows for involuntary servitude as a punishment for crime. Prison Inc. Topic drama Kids for Cash Scandal has also led to several portrayals in fictional works. Both the Law and Order, SVU episode Crush and an episode of The Good Wife featured corrupt judges sending children to private detention centers. An episode of Cold Case titled, Jurisprudence is loosely based on this event. Season 3 of Orange is the New Black portrays the transformation of the prison from federally owned to a for-profit. <laughs> See also <laughs>